All right, hello, my name is Ellen Mueller. I'm the director of the MFA program at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And before I introduce our speakers for this event, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. Gathering here, we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but via racist laws that have segregated all people. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience. And with that, I'm gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping for this, um, this conference this evening. So you'll notice your audio and video will be muted for this webinar. And we have a questions area. So if you'd like to leave any comments or especially questions for our presenters, please enter them in that questions area and I'll be monitoring that all evening. And we'll, when we get to q and I'll be pulling from what was submitted. Um, also, a recording of this webinar will be made available. Um, everybody who registered, I'll email those links out as soon as we have them ready. And if you're curious about the full agenda for the evening, go ahead and visit this link and you can see uh, more information about each and every one of our speakers in order. Also, you'll notice there's a handout in your navigation area. You can download that PDF and it links to great um, crowdsource materials and other information about the conference itself. Um, and if you experience any technical difficulties of any kind tonight, you can email us and we'll do our best to help out and get things back on track. So this event is sponsored by the MCAD MFA program. And if you're curious about our program, you can learn more at the link listed here, mcad-mfa.com. And also, when we were originally planning this event, it was going to be in person. It was in early June, and um, we had this fantastic uh, tour that was set up for the day after the conference called Learning from Place Bedote. And um, this is a really fantastic program. And even though we weren't able to do it in person with the conference due to the rescheduling, I wanted to give this program a, a big shout out because they're really terrific. Um, Good news, they just let us know that they're full. Um, both of their two remaining tours for the summer on August 9th and September 12th are now waitlist only. If you're in the Twin Cities area, I would encourage you to um, get on their waitlist. And if you're able to get in for one of those tours this summer, it'll just be a really great experience. You can find that by Googling Learning From Place Bedote, it'll come right up. And also an event like this doesn't happen uh, without the help of a lot of really terrific people. I'd like to give a shout out to both our technical help and our administrative support. We've got Kylie Van Note, Seth Dalside, Cleo Young, Lauren Zimich, and Nikki Modicolum have been so, so helpful in making sure this event comes together. And um, I, I, these are our speakers for this evening. Evening, and I want to welcome you and thank you one more time for sticking with us. I know we've rescheduled a few times, so it's so great to be here this evening with all of you. Um, the idea for this conference came from the recognition that many programs in higher education are moving towards increasing community engagement and uh, experiential learning, many with place-based themes. And as time passed this spring, we've seen place highlighted as we live through an ongoing pandemic, uh, we grapple with civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd and too many others at the hands of the police. And uh, with recent regulations affecting our international students, which were just now rescinded earlier this week, there's so many ways that the theme of place intersects with our daily lives. So today I'm really excited that we're gonna examine the concept of place from many different points of view. We're gonna hear from artists, educators, curators, and I hope that everybody will be able to find something useful in these presentations that they can take with them afterwards. Um, so let's start off by getting a little bit of a sense of who everyone is. Seth, if you could execute our first poll, this is gonna ask us um, what area of art or education do you work in or participate in? So if you could just vote in that poll, this will give us a little bit of a snapshot of who's here with us in, in the virtual room tonight. 
So we're at about 75% voted. Just a few more people if you want to click on which one best suits you. And then we'll take a look at the results. Go ahead, Seth. I think we're in a good place here. Almost everybody. And great, it looks like 9% of people are from a K through 12 environment. Uh, majority, 85% are coming from higher ed. We've got 30% of people coming from community-based or nonprofit um, environments, and then 9% are from other places. So that gives everyone a sense of, of what people are coming from. So um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Karen Gurgley, pronouns she, her, who will be presenting Teaching Rural Community Engagement. And while we're waiting for that to come up, a reminder, do be sure to put your questions into um, the question box. That makes for a really exciting and fruitful Q&A session afterwards. Okay, I think I'm ready. Am I on? Thanks, Karen. You sound great. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Ellen, and the team for all of your work that you put into this conference. I'm really grateful to be here and so honored to be among so many esteemed voices. I'm a multidisciplinary artist and educator originally from West Virginia and currently living in the rural community of Lamoni, Iowa. Uh, the town is about 1,500 people between Kansas City and Des Moines, and each square there, like the bigger square, is about one mile. So you may be able to see that most of the town exists in a one square mile block. And here it is zoomed out in Des Moines, it's up at the top. Um, I teach at Graceland University, which is a school of about 800 students, and I was originally trained as a carpenter and a painter. My main jam is cultivating and elevating the social and creative community capital in small communities, and trying to do that through shared experiences, storytelling, and visual art. I've been working on seeking shared understanding in communities, exploring shared norms, shared histories, trust, and reciprocity. I like to think about this shared social capital in things that are unseen and seen, tangible and intangible, and impact these relationships have on individuals, groups, and the community at large. I'm making the assumption that most of us attending this conference acknowledge the health of the community can always, like can often be linked to the public art within that community and arts presence in general. Group source public art has a way of bringing community together with a sense of pride and ownership and has the possibility to add economic vitality and the potential to evoke economic growth. The two projects that I want to share this evening both occur in rural or what we may consider economically challenged communities. One in rural Iowa where I live and I just showed and uh, the other in my, in my home state West Virginia where I work in the summer months with a program called Governor's Honors Academy. Both are communities that we may classify as run down, each has its challenges. For example, many of the storefronts in downtown Lamoni are empty, in disrepair, or even burned down, and they remain so. In Huntington, West Virginia, we see the evidence of rampant opioid crisis and a struggle to revitalize small communities. And each of these communities are trying to rebuild a sense of place, pride, and community. It's important for me to mention that the emphasis that I can and emphasize that I consider these murals and projects essentially artifacts or remnants of the community building and participation built as a result of painting together. These are evidence of a shared experience. These are small visual representations of this engagement, not a community fixer, but a step in the direction of furthering community. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge that there are many stereotypes surrounding arts supported arts support in rural places and sometimes we see a lack of funding or at least on the surface we know that there is quite often a great deal of money to create in these communities through grants focused on rural revitalization and often the poorest communities have access to the most funding another stereotype is that sometimes rural communities are seen as uneducated or we think that community members won't accept or quote unquote get contemporary art and we know that's largely untrue and sometimes that's our job to help communities see their potential by really taking the time to get to know the community investing in it we find ways to bring many voices together and share stories share pain share hopes for the future hopes for the community as a whole and all of this takes time and real intention to help the individual feel valued and honored exactly where they are the Lamona mural. The Lamona mural really started with a series of conversations, trying to figure out a way for town and gown to merge and to think about revitalization. Lamona is built, it was built in the mid 1800s by the split of the Mormon church, the reorganized church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, later named the Community of Christ. 
In the 1880s, the church built Graceland University with the intent of largely serving church affiliates. Now, although the church still sponsors the university, only about 10% or less are affiliated with the church. I gathered with a small group of students and community members from disparate backgrounds, what I would call an advisory council for this project. Some elders of the community, others comprised of younger voices, some town historians, and others that simply called them on my home for a few years while they're attending school. We asked ourselves a lot of questions, the big ones being investigating about the location of the mural, the history of the area, the present, the current, what's the space doing right now, and what we saw in its future. We wrote a grant and the advisory council dispersed in the community listening and researching. A couple of things were really important for me as the first mural in town since the 1990s, uh, well, early 1990, it was, uh, which was a very small, very faded, very Iowa-centric mural that had a lot of corn. Um, and to be transparent, the first real mural I had done, even though I had a painting degree. One, I wanted to make sure the idea of the development came from a diverse group of community and students. So we have many voices heard and integrated. I wanted to collaborate with our service learning students. So as you can see them here, helping us work with the building owner to prepare our space. That shed you see there uh, is full of the building owner's stored taxes, years and years and years of her taxes. And one of the building professors, or the business professors at the university, moonlights as a crane operator and moved the building for us. We wanted to make it accessible to actually paint, that it didn't take a specialist knowledge of painting to participate. So you can see that many of the spaces are essentially kind of a paint by number. I wanted to shift the ownership from me to we. I didn't want to just get it done either. I wanted the space to be the hangout space for the town, for the length of the painting, so that when we scheduled block parties to do work on this thing, we had music and energy, cookout. So it generated a sense of belonging, place, and the sense of the town starting to cultivate some new energy. I didn't want it to become a stamp mural that just showed up overnight, although because of this mural, some other students have done that since and been super successful and fun. But I wanted it to be the coolest place in town, like the mall in the 90s. I love the 90s. I wanted this to be a learning process that instilled self-efficacy, that I can do it kind of mantra, that the community could see how they, we, could do more of these things, and the students could take these skills and energy back to their home communities as well. I wanted it to look good, but not in a really like, prideful way, uh, but in a way that we could do something small together and perhaps a bit conservative with a splash of contemporary to build trust to fuel future projects, ones that are bolder, more contemporary, involved more voices, and perhaps had an edgier, more call to an action. Uh, a lot of those things worked. We got a lot of press, a little increased tourism. The town and the mural is now part of the Jefferson Highway. More students are making the very short trek into town, which led them to spending more time at the coffee shop, leading them to hit the thrift show, store, and in general, interact with more community members. That 90s mall vibe happened, and I'd like to think it was the ultimate hangout for that span of time where we worked on the mural. And now I have students reaching out to me that have returned to their communities and hometowns telling me about their public art projects. So some of those students also took the social engagement course that we offered earlier at the school. I think we gained some street cred. Uh, in hopes that we can do something more powerful, perhaps more subversive or socially charged projects in the future. Um, and there'll be another one happening this fall in a community really close to us, which is cool. Um, we started to see a larger ripple effect and echo throughout the students in town, hashtag goals. Here's a mural design competition led by um, students. Student-led social engaged projects started in the assistant living community with local businesses and two more community-driven murals are on their way. Um, as well as a story collecting, story share project between students and community members on why they've stayed in the community. This is the first of three large billboard type signs that are going up um, when COVID thaws. Um, and QR codes that link the images to stories on a website they had developed. Not solely because of this, but another victory that might be indirectly linked to this process project and the ripple effect was um, a Walt Whitman inspired mural by my colleagues poetry and social justice class and a newly created social change major dedicated to seeking cultural spaces uh, it, to pursue a passion for advocacy, justice and social change um, and that will roll out this fall just in about a month. Jump to West Virginia. West Virginia Governor's Honors Academy brings 200 high achieving high school students to a college campus for a state funded three week intensive program. Our theme last year was A Silent World, uh, to amplify the voices that, of those who may only be at a whisper. This is my morning class. It's an intensive class of 10 students. 
It's not a secret that West Virginia is heavily targeted for stereotypes, most recently through Hillbilly Elegy, the ongoing opioid crisis, the guise of low intelligence and economic disaster. And because these obvious economic challenges in the state, lack of educational opportunities, and in many cases, challenges to young people's LGBTQ status and many other reasons, many young people are choosing to leave West Virginia. The Governor's Honors Academy helps students learn and understand their value and role in addressing these stereotypes. After meeting with the community organizer in Huntington, uh, in a small subset, we made connections with a building owner who had four boarded up windows to paint on the side of an old fire station that you can see here. Initially, for the safety and convenience, uh, our honors director thought that we should paint the mural on wooden panels to be installed in the windows at the end of the program. However, I felt like it was a really important aspect of the project for us to be immersed in the community. We also wanted the whole 50-foot wall, the length of the building, and not just the windows. Well, we got that. We got both of those things. Um, this would require our students to take public bus to the site every day and interact with the community that they're working in. We established a sense of monogamy as we saw the same people every day, which led to like real excitement and investment. This included those who identified as homeless, afflicted by uh, addiction, all groups which my students embraced and built relationships with. Those identifying parties gave up, brought all they had, including free food they had received from local coffee shops in exchange for a conversation. And this became one of the most rewarding parts of the project. I wanted to spend quality time learning from the community and building the design with them and with the space in mind. So we worked hard to be genuine and kind, to be good listeners and investigators. We learned about the history of the community and asked a lot of questions as to what was truly important to the current and future community. We snuck the students out way after dark, which was the first for the academy, and to our delight, the community came out to watch and participate with us and kind of watch over us that night as we traced the mural on the side of the building. Like the mural on the Monet, we wanted the design to be simple enough to invite the community to paint with us, which happened. You can see here my students painting, becoming skill sharers for the project, note the bullhorn and the unicorn hats. Throughout the process, my students met with documentary filmmaker who taught them how to create their own documentary featuring conversations with a variety of community members and historians and had a public showing of the documentary. This project happened conception to completion in three weeks flat, Monday to Friday with just about two and a half hours per day and much of it in 100 degree heat. Students and community remained resilient and invested. The local news came to cover um, the making of the mural and to the students' delight, uh, we ended up getting um, picked up by the US News and World Report and our story traveled throughout the country, um, which helped these young West Virginians see the change in their community and in themselves. They saw that as young West Virginians, big things are possible and small projects could indeed be a catalyst for authentic social engagement. As I mentioned before, the mural and the documentary in this case is really a vehicle for storytelling, story sharing, and community building. It gives purpose to an action and it's an expression of love, a catalyst for more community engagement. It provides space for interaction and investigation, a space for learning and listening, not telling and dictating, a means for sharing and empowering, a visual representation of an inward change and growth. The Huntington community is sponsoring a second mural adjacent to the one that we painted last summer, um, which nods to our work last um, summer and that's happening right now. And we're excited to see more of these ripple effects throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was fantastic. Next, we have Brandon Waybright, pronouns he, him, who will be presenting Branding Place. And as we're queuing this up, a reminder, you can uh, drop questions for the panelists into our question box, and I'm copying and pasting those, lining them up for the Q&A. Good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever this is for, for you. Uh, I'm excited to share with you a tool that I've been developing through my coursework that's been about branding and design related to place. Now, before I get too far, I wanted to say that I have uploaded this presentation as well as the toolkit I've been developing onto a Google Drive. You can find it at this URL, tiny.cc slash brand place. And my presentation today has two parts. One is about design, branding, and placemaking. And the second part is the start of the tool that I've been building and how it's kind of played out, at least in one example. Now, that part one, I just wanted to note that I come at design from kind of a, a hybrid socially engaged art plus commercial practice space. And I'm really curious about bridging the gap between these two worlds because I think that there's been a lot that's been learned in socially engaged art practices about criticality and reflection. 
that hasn't been applied into broader commercial practices. And unfortunately, most of my students get into that commercial activity and I wanna find, take the learnings from one and bring it into the other. So that's where I'm coming from. And at the end of the day, my kind of goal statement for this, it's the most design thinky format, so I apologize for that. But how might I prepare my students for their professional future and encourage them to realize the racism embedded in their discipline? Because there's a lot of things that we need to deal with. Design has a pretty problematic history and an incredibly pr problematic present. Um, and for a long time, I've accepted that. But uh, following in the ideals of Angela Davis, I think that it's not a time for accepting that anymore. We need to start working at change in the things I cannot accept. And one of the things I can't accept is where commercial design is to, in spite of how much we engage critically and thoughtfully through the academy or through socially engaged practices. Now, I should also acknowledge like I'm a bald white guy. I'm the product of hillbillies and absentee Shawnee out of West Virginia. I have lived with a ton of privilege. And so I, as much as I say any of this, it could come across accusatory. I'm pretty much accusing myself in every single word I have on here. So I am not free from this space. I am certainly one who has been living in light of this. Um, but I have engaged in a lot of pro projects and practices around these places. So um, everything on here is stuff that I've been engaged in that kind of splits the difference between commercial and socially engaged work from cultural trails that I'm working on in my hometown um, in partnership with several nonprofits, uh, community engagement activities through these hybrid interdisciplinary events that we've held in public spaces throughout Chicago, um, civic signage, what I think of as also places, digital places where I've been constructing hubs and community spaces for people, as well as proposals that I'll get into more with that borough homes. Now, when we talk about design in kind of a corporate commercial space, um, and in particular when we talk about placemaking, we often are referring to like dumb activities like sticking a beer tap in the office or creating a little lounge to make you know place for employees. And now I love these things for sure, but are they really what we mean when we talk about placemaking? Or we can talk about like the larger, more ambitious community projects where like we create some hipster, groovy, markety things, like stuff that's very Instagrammable, where people can hang out and play on a short basketball hoop, or we just install a, a sudden installation where people buy things. Um, that it's problematic, you know, if that's what we talk about. And honestly, that's what a lot of designers mean when they start talking about place. Their, their goal is to kind of infiltrate and adapt. Now, there are other people who have been talking about place in the through design practices that have been a little more critical and thoughtful. Meta Haven's uncorporate identity and it, it particularly its projects around the, the area of Sealand or its more recent work uh, about the borderlines has been really thoughtful. There's also people like JR who have been doing large scale public works, um, trying to reconstitute how cities see themselves. Particularly, I was there when he was putting up his Eyes of Los Angeles, um, where he, ha he was trying to force Los Angeles to reckon with the fact that people age and that there is history here um, and that we should celebrate and regard these people instead of hiding them away. Um, but my basic philosophy about what design should be rather than what it is, is that branding and placemaking should be an echo and an aim of that which exists. It's not there to change things, it is there to develop, to partner with, to cultivate, to come alongside, to be part of. That's probably the way, to be part of the place. Um, and when I talk about place, I do think we should have a huge all-encompassing space. So when we talk about design, we should have that same sense. Like it's the sense, it's the environment, it's the history, it's the textures, it's the events, it's the people, it's the 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 happenings, you know, there's so much that goes into making a place become what it is. And all of that should have some influence or some respect within any brand or design work that happens for it. Now, another acknowledgement we also need to make about design is that every act of creation is also an act of destruction. Every time we put something up, we're at the very least distracting from other things that could be there. And I think nothing is more like points out the problem of this more publicly than perhaps the Rio Olympics, which are very temporary designed environments that, that then often are either removed or they start to degrade after time. So the Rio Olympics, a particular point I just want to point here, here's designers intervening in a space, installing a wall that is literally engaged in erasure. This wall has one purpose and it's to separate out so that people driving on the freeway don't have to see that there are poor people who live nearby. They're covering an area, covering a quote unquote blemish through design. It is literal, it's a wall of erasure. That's what's going on there. Just to make people feel better about being at the Olympics in this space, to make people who are in charge feel better about what they're presenting to the world. 
that seems highly problematic um, and certainly an act of destruction that is an act of creation. I mean, design often evolves around these lines. It's about trying to make something look better and more appealing. And eventually design just starts to grow like a moss or a lichen, obliterating the surfaces of things and then yelling for people's attention so much and to the point that we are so saturated. I mean, we are creating the spectacle that Guy Debord was writing about in Society of the Spectacle. It is there. We are in it. Um, when cities get a hold of the idea of civic branding or placemaking, they often just like start slapping massive signage um, into their town to get people to take pictures in front of it. It's fascinating. It's interesting. But again, it's a very synthesized version of place. Even projects like this, which I will admit, I think it's gorgeous and stunning. I want to be there. But, but at the end of the day, this is, again, design kind of serving as creating a false front for things. It's not actually changing or partnering with the space. It's just creating a new presentation that makes people more comfortable or in awe of a place. And what, we're, what I'm seeing from my observations is that design has failed to be adequately critical, at least outside of the context of our institutions, the places where we are adept at this. But when it comes to commercial practice, this stuff keeps happening. This is the norm. It is not the critically engaged design that we often talk about in class. People have bought into the idea that the purpose of design is to increase power, and they aren't asking the question about whose power is being increased through that work, who is being favored by it. So if we're really honest about the last few decades, the practice of design has often been an, just another method of promoting white supremacy. It really has been, because think about where design is coming from, like the history, the awards, the authority figures, even the way we evaluate design practices. If it had a theme song, it would be this one. Like it is incredibly painfully, horrifically white. And just on that point of evaluation, because that's one where I sometimes get pushback, just consider what's on a typical design rubric. Like when we talk about grids, when we talk about design principles, we're talking about like stuff that is rooted in white European male dominance. Um, we need to think differently about this because if we're operating out of this context and putting things that cover up pasts in the cities, we are engaging in the recreation of the world to better match white identity. That is a problem. It's inconvenient, but placemaking within design that's been engaged on critically is doing this. And many people have thought that the solution to this is something like design thinking or better research. But the problem is design thinking hasn't been asking the important critical questions. Um, even recently, there was, a, there was a workshop where someone from IDEO mentioned, like, was pointedly asked about, do, does design thinking actually encourage white supremacism? And they said, well, I guess if it's in the hand of white supremacists, it probably does. That's a problem. Like we, we need to be more critical. We can't just keep changing the world and not asking what's happening because uncritical placemaking is just short form gentrification and the promotion of white supremacy. We need to move on. We need a critical conversation that enters our commercial design context. I also wanted to point out that, that uh, Adair Mosley, which is kind of appropriate because uh, he is based in Minneapolis, I believe. He had this really great thought that's about social service at, at large. And I think it's definitely true of design as social service. We have often approached this work in a very prescriptive way that's anchored in our own pride, that's anchored in creating something wonderful, creating our portfolio, create something that makes us look good. But that's not a great way to do it. And I love where he continues. What we need to start thinking about is asking the right questions. And particularly in social services, we often get to the wrong answer because we're not actually listening. This got me thinking about how can we start to ask better questions? What kind of questions could those be? And how do we help train my students and myself to start actually listening for helpful answers that could start to address the issues I'm seeing within commercial design practices? My basic theory here is if we can co-opt popular tools, there's some tools they're expected to know, like they're expected to know the IDEO design thinking process. That's just so buzzwordy in commercial practice today that you, you kind of need to be aware of it to engage the field. Now, if we can co-opt some of those tools so they kind of learn about them, but they learn about them to take control of them, if we can along the way re-emphasize critical process, re-emphasize re the fact of like being internally critical and externally critical through the work you're making, if we can refocus the way we evaluate our work, then I think design can be a way of understanding significant issues. Yes, even commercial design can be a way of understanding significant issues in our society. So here's the, se the simpler version of that, my idea. If we can take design thinking tools, add in layers of cultural systems analysis, and build in better critical self-reflection into the process, and we can present our students with that in process, they're going to become more adept at recognizing the cultural biases and problems and systemic issues within the design work that they are doing. 
the tool I've developed is really built out of that idea, that's that core idea. And it has several phases um, that are made for it. So the idea of this is this tool could be applied to a branding project or a project that's in a community. Um, at almost any level, um, and you walk through building a background on that community so you kind of understand what you're going into and who to look for and who to talk to, uh, getting into preparation before you even enter that community so you don't just run in there not knowing a single thing, uh, opening up a practice of listening. How do we actually listen well and what do we need to be listening for and who are we listening to? Then through brainstorming, through sharing the work with that community so that they can actually speak into process, not just be recipients of work. Moving into modification of the work based on the community's needs, response, issues, desires. And then thinking about how we celebrate the work, celebrate the community through the release of it. And finally, what it will take to maintain that work so it doesn't die on a hill as soon as people, anyone steps out of it. The biggest difference this tool offers from typical design tools and strategy documents is that it just adds in a layer of broader understanding of structures and place within it. Um, it thinks more expansively about those two categories than I've seen typical design tools thinking about. And the other thing that is in there is every single phase engages self-critical reflection. Who did you talk to? What are the sources of information? Who are the people of interest? Who is held on the outskirts? Um, what is your relationship to the community that's going on there? All these questions we should be automatically asking, but students are rarely often trained to, or they're only trained to in the context of a classroom rather than outside of the classroom projects. Now this tool was first developed for use during a student project that was called Burrow. It was a tiny home project. What the students were asked to do in this project was to create designs for a tiny home community to serve single mothers in our hometown. Um, so this was a real world project with real world clients and partners. Um, essentially they had thought we'd just make like nice environmental graphics that would make people happy about being there. And th that would be cool just in and of its own self. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but as we started to get engaged through this tool, the, the conversation started to shift because what we found were issues that the community was actually dealing with already and issues that the community was going to begin dealing with over the next few years that we could help uh, partner with, that we could help become a part of um, by advocating for and cultivating the growth of that community rather than just slapping graphics up in that space. So what they kind of came to, at least within this one semester project, at least the first time we rolled it out, was eventually um, a toolkit of its own. It, it was a guide for the community to um, building their community, to mindful construction policies, and to professional branding and promotion of that community. This whole tool was given to the community itself to be self, so they could advocate. Um, it identified, they went through a whole process of identifying the issues that uh, drove the community, like that drove the community to need to exist, the partners who were part of it, who, and what they contributed, um, the work that was already underway. It, it laid out a context to it, and then it developed a plan that was made in collaboration with the community so that there were leaders in the community ready to take it on. Um, this included everything from plans for how to build uh, future buildings and homes for more cost-effective measures given the skill set of the community. Uh, it also developed uh, consideration of the environment around that community and how it could affect people and what kind of things would be planted there. It gave a core branding package. And ultimately what happened was what I saw was a balance of cultural realization. They realized that in order to engage this community, they really needed to truly understand it um, and they needed to actually be part of it. Like this is my students. They're like, we need to spend more time in the community, talking with people, being with people. And we also need to be like, not just popping in and out of there to do some cool design thing. We need to do something that, that lasts, that matters, and, and that can be owned by the community. Not like, this isn't a portfolio. One of the students said, this is not a portfolio piece. This is like me trying to actually be helpful. Um, and I think that was just amazing because my students are really driven to like the idea of, I need to find commercial success. So it's just one example of kind of the things that can come of this, but. I'd love for you to spend time looking at the tool. If we were in person, I would have had us do an exercise where we use some of this. It's a little harder to facilitate in this format um, and in this time frame because it is a slow, long process. But at least I could share this tool with you. And if you have comments, it, it is a work in progress. There are things I change about every year. There's things I learn and grow. And of course, uh, our world changes a little bit. So there's actually a whole new thing I need to start thinking about because I have not adapted this in consideration of COVID, in consideration of, of, of everything that's happened since June. Um, there's a lot of work to still be done, but I'm very excited about how this is starting to change my commercially minded designers 
by applying some things that I've learned about self-criticism and reflection through socially engaged practice. So that's all for me. If you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm uh, looking forward to talk with you and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was great. Um, next, we have Greg Blair, pronouns he, him, who will be presenting a project for students developed to encourage site interventions. Hello. Uh, thank you to Ellen and anyone else that is listening that uh, persevered and helped make this conference um, actually happen and come together. I'm so glad that it did. Um, I want to talk to you today about a specific project that I developed several years ago. And before I dive into the specifics of the project, I just want to give you some context of where I was working and the kinds of students I was working with when I developed this project. It was developed while I was teaching at a small uh, state university in South Dakota. Most of the students that we had at that time um, come from rural areas. And this was project was developed for um, intro, an introduction to sculpture project. And most of the students that I worked with, it's the first kind of sculptural course they have taken. And um, it's, perhaps maybe the only sculpture course that they might take um, in their academic career. So it, I kind of had this special opportunity and this special moment to get them to um, critically think about landscape. And for most of them, it was the first opportunity or first challenge that they've ever been asked to do that, to, to critically look, look around in the spaces that they occupy and that they habitate and um, think about different questions about those spaces. So the way that I usually introduce this project is I have them do a reading, some type of reading before they get into class. Um, the one that I have listed there on the screen is one I've used quite a bit. It's a, it's a nice little essay by uh, John Stilgo who teaches at Harvard. Um, and he, uh, much of it is him asking the question, uh, what is landscape and how is landscape constituted. I also have used in the past, there's a great text by uh, Tim Cresswell called Place and Introduction. And so I've used that one as well. So they come in with a little bit of um, knowledge already about where our conversation might be headed for that class. And then we start to have a conversation. And it usually starts with me asking the kinds of questions that I have listed here. How is place constituted? Does place have have to have physical boundaries? You know, how do spaces or places or landscapes come to have meaning? Why do they have those specific meanings that that they currently have? Um, has that changed over time? How do spaces or places come to have value? Why do some places have more value or a different kind of value than other places? And one of the things that usually comes out of this discussion and um, kind of interaction between myself and, and the students all together is that we really sort of paint this picture of place and landscape as a palimpsest of layer, a layered palimpsest of, of different desires and histories and identities that um, can stay together in kind of a layered networked fashion. So after we kind of have this discussion, I introduce or challenge them that I want them to create an, a site intervention, an intervention that can change the meaning, perception, or value of a place. And again, we talk about, you know, what is a place? And I remind them, you know, places can vary in scale and type um, immensely. My, my own body can be a place just as much as a building might be a place or a city might be a place. So to give them a little bit of inspiration and some historical context and historical examples, we look at a few artists, you know, so how could you, you know, complete this challenge? How could you fulfill it? And so I show them, and I'm just gonna share a few with you. I show them some artists that are dealing with some of these ideas in their own artwork. So we look at the walking pieces that 
the mediated um, landscape pieces that Janet Cardiff has made. We look at the walks that Terry Reeb has made as well. We look at pieces like David Burns playing the building, uh, where he hooked this organ up so that you literally can uh, play the building in this installation. You can sit down at this organ and each key is connected to a different sound uh, that the building makes. We look at ones that are a little, you know, a little more whimsical, these slides that uh, Karsten Holler is sort of famous for installing in different interior spaces, which you can ride after you've signed a waiver. But we also talk about street art as well, and the idea that a site intervention can, can be subtle and nuanced, and that it doesn't have to be aggressive or monolithic. It really can be small and maybe only catches the attention and changes the perception of that place or that site for a limited number of people or maybe only one person. So we talk, you know, we talk about examples of yarn bombing as street art and as ways of, you know, intervening into a site. You know, I show them these kind of examples and I've had students that have done something similar where, you know, we don't have to be constructing an object that gets inserted into a site. Uh, maybe it's something as simple as a sign, um, redesign a sign or introduce a new sign or something like the image you're looking at. Again, something like this, you know, just like a subtle sort of placement, very small in scale, but is still kind of meeting the challenge of this specific project. So to end with, I just want to show you a few of the actual student projects, the things that students have done when they've had to do this site intervention project. And this piece was created by a runner. She was on our cross country running team at our university. And so she wanted to somehow reference that part of her identity. So she made a large shoe print just made out of dirt. She chose dirt so that it could re remain ephemeral and it wasn't permanent. And this sidewalk that she's chosen is where the cross country team runs every day. So it was sort of her creating something for her friends, but she was also interested in the idea that it would be temporary. And as people ran over this, it would eventually, and I think it lasted about a day, it eventually kind of got kicked and destroyed as people crossed over on top of it. This is another site intervention that a student made. This was a student that had recently relocated, was originally from Montana and came to our school to attend university there. And she decided to do a site intervention that was extremely personal. It was, it was for her because she was so new to the region, she felt sort of disconnected, disengaged from the landscape. And she was sort of inspired by Anna Mendieta's work and decided to create this, this real sort of um, tactile and haptic kind of attempt to merge herself with this new landscape that she found herself in as a student. So this is some photographs of her trying to do that, of her you know, physically merging with the landscape. This is another piece that a different student did in which she made this sort of human form and covered it with shreds of tissue paper. So it sort of looks like a pinata, a human pinata, but the way that she has covered it and then she put it on one of the prominent walking areas, one of the one of the major sidewalks that runs through our campus at that time and placed it sort of out in the open without any signage or any indication of what this was. And people's reaction was kind of interesting because some uh, passersby like this woman pictured here did really not pay much attention to it. But other people were sort of um, startled by it because from a distance and because of the covering on it, you cannot tell if it's a real person or not. So you're wondering if is the, you know, some people approached it very apprehensively, wondering if this is a person in a suit about to jump up at me or what is really going on here. So it was kind of an interesting sort of unusual and mysterious and ambiguous addition uh, to this spot on campus. This piece is, 
you know, a little more, a little more simple and a little more subtle, but I think equally effective and successful. So that this student, she simply took some tomatoes from a community garden that she had a plot in and le left her tomatoes there, but arranged them on the ground so that there was sort of something unexpected or un unusual for other people that would come to the community garden, something um, that they could see. This was a project, uh, this semester, by the time we did this project, it was getting close to the end of the fall semester break and getting close to the holiday break. So this student made these little packages, these little um, presents, which she placed all over campus in a lot of a wide variety of different places. And they have a little tag that says, open me, and then on the inside, and she wanted people to take these with them. Um, when you take it and you open it, um, she has hand drawn different uh, posting, different tweets that she found on Twitter by searching the hashtag all I want for Christmas. And what's interesting about these is the wide variety of, of things that people are hoping for in their lives. So on the left hand side, you can see one of them says all I want for Christmas are fundamental rights to my own body. And the one below says, all I want for Christmas is to become a mom. So it was kind of these little surprises that she left all over campus that people could take with them and then open up and have this glimpse into sort of another person's existence. This is the last piece that I'm gonna talk about. And it kind of um, had one of maybe the strongest or most interesting reactions of any student projects that have been completed while doing this site intervention challenge. And what this student had an idea for, and we had talked a lot about are the culturally prescribed behaviors that are acceptable and not acceptable in certain places and spaces. And so what she decided to do is go out onto our campus green in the middle of this small rural campus. And she brought a blanket and a pillow and pretended like she was sleeping on the ground. And you can see she's sort of half on the sidewalk and half um, into the grassy area. But again, there was kind of a wide variety of reactions. Um, she ended up laying there for about three hours. Uh, some people walked by and, you know, kind of gave her a glance and didn't really think much of it and kept and continued on their way. While uh, many other people actually came over and talked to her and made sure that she was all right, asked her what she was doing showed some real care and concern for um, her well-being to make sure that she was all right. And so she had some interesting reactions uh, to the people that saw her in this space and saw what she was doing in this space. The project finally came to an end when um, another professor came out of, from one of the buildings uh, that, did, that doesn't have the art department in a different building came out and talked to this student and got to the point where uh, he threatened to call the police if she did not get up and leave. And apparently the main issue that he had was that he, he was teaching a class in one of the buildings and someone in the class had spotted her and the class was no longer paying attention to him and they were all crowded up against the window, looking out the window to see what is going on in the campus screen, what is that person doing? So in terms of creating a subversive intervention. Um, I think this one was really successful, but it really sort of spoke to the kinds of ideas that she was really interested in about these kind of acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And at least for this uh, person, her behavior that she was doing by sleeping there was one that was unacceptable in that place. That is it for me, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Greg. Next, we have Alexis Riviere, pronouns she, her, who will be presenting hashtag I am the flag, power at the intersection of masked performance and place. And as a reminder, feel free to stick your questions into the questions area. We'll make sure to answer those during the Q&A. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank MCAD MFA, Ellen Mueller, and Robert Bupp for the opportunity to present this evening. 
My name is Alexis Riviere, and I am an interdisciplinary artist and educator. My topic for this evening will be hashtag I am the flag, power at the intersection of mass performance and place. Oh, I should put this down. Um, today, I'll share with you an introduction to my practice, specifically looking at the performance, hashtag I am the flag. So I create masks, typically handmade from my personal clothing or material from my everyday, and are embellished with materials like broken mirror, glass, beads, paint, embroidery, nails, etc. These images are a glimpse into my overall characters and persona, each one taking a topic in my personal narrative, chronicling experiences relating to the performative nature of Black womanhood in public space. In regards to place, my work engages with three sites, the body, the performance zone, or the physical place I inhabit, and what I call the third stage, or the virtual as a site for performative gestures and narratives to unfold. I'll touch briefly on this QR code at the bottom of the screen. One of the ways in which I introduce moving images and supplemental narratives into exhibition spaces is through the utilization of QR codes or quick response codes. Um, to watch the full performance for hashtag I am the flag, I invite you to screen grab this slide or use your camera phone um, to scan the code with your iPhone and follow the link at the close of this conference to view. If you're an Android user, I encourage you to download a free, a free QR scanner and scan the link later to experience the full performance. Here I am, seated in a mask that I constructed from an American flag with a singular zipper hand sewn down the middle. There I am, having been frustrated by the repetitive images of black and brown bodies in the media fatally falling as a result of police brutality, gun violence, and lone wolf terrorism. I created On Being, the first in a series of mass characters who investigate the ways in which the representation of race through language and visual media play a role in how we are socialized in the United States. Here I am in dialogue with you, a conversation on being, on existence. It has been said that taking a knee as an act of protest to police brutality in the United States is disrespectful to this country, to those who serve, and to the flag. To those sentiments, I say, I am the flag. As the media began to change the narrative surrounding the intentions within the take a knee protest, it was my, my goal to realign the gesture with its original meaning, an act of resistance towards systematic oppression, especially in regards to police brutality. In 2017, the performance hashtag I am the flag was staged in both Wichita, Kansas and in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri to create a dialogue around collective action, drawing connections between the events of fatal police shootings in both cities as in the case of John Paul Quintero in Wichita and Michael Brown Jr. in Ferguson, which is a greater suburb, or which is a suburb in the greater St. Louis metropolitan. In the performance, hashtag I am the flag, I took a knee. And when I was approached or someone would pass by me, I would fall violently in death, repeating these gestures cyclically as a parallel to my experiences continually watching Black deaths on social media and the news. As for audience engagement, many viewers diverted their attention to their cellular devices or the monuments around me um, with their head down walking by. Few people took notice and some even showed concern for my perceived condition. However, for the most part, the overarching response was apathy. In reviewing the documentation of this work, particularly the video, it seems that my audience, unaware that they were participants in public performance art, mirrored the ways in which many have come to respond to the all common police shootings, amongst other injustices, indifference. It was important for me 
that this work not only engaged in questions surrounding the spectacle of black death and collective trauma perpetuated through the media, but to be in dialogue with the existing history of the place. In this case, placing the work within the green space between the St. Louis Arch and the old courthouse, both significant landmarks within the 90.96 acre Gateway Arch National Park in St. Louis, Missouri. The Gateway Arch draws millions of visitors yearly to view its iconic 630 foot stature, the tallest monument in this nation. A monument commemorating Thomas Jefferson and St. Louis's role in westward expansion. Famously known as the Gateway to the West, daily visitors take the eternal tram to the highest point for breathtaking views of East St. Louis, Illinois, the Metro East or downtown or the downtown area of St. Louis on the opposite side, the Metro West, in addition to the Mississippi River that divides them. Included in this view is the old courthouse, which is shown in this image, which sits directly opposite of the arch. The old courthouse is often recognized for being the site where Dred Scott and his wife Harriet, who were slaves, filed for their freedom in the case Dred Scott versus Sanford. Ultimately, the Supreme Court denied their freedom, declaring that no Negroes were entitled to freedom. This case was regarded as one of the catalysts to the Civil War, which ultimately established freedom for, enslaved, for the enslaved across the US. It is often overlooked that the east steps of the old course courthouse, which I faced while I knelt, is a site where over 500 slaves were sold during antebellum St. Louis. On the screen, a depiction or a painting um, of a slave auction at the courthouse east steps. And on the right, myself as on being, activating those steps in protest. The biography of the St. Louis Arch reveals that a thriving African-American community, Mill Creek Valley was demolished and displaced in order to erect the gateway to the West and an interstate which crosses through this site as well. The yellow rectangular area shown on the bottom right picture indicates where the National Park and Gateway Arch are today and where Mill Creek Valley once, one of St. Louis's oldest neighborhoods once stood. The arrow on the far left points to the old courthouse and each red arrow indicates performative zones I have inhabited within the work. Inserting this performance within the historical narratives of enslavement, segregation, practices, and displacement, which includes both the Mill Creek Valley neighborhood and Native Americans doing westward expansion, allowed me the opportunity to engage with the complexity of how we are still wrestling with the aftermath of those choices made by those who have laid the foundation for life in St. Louis, and also in this country and the world. We would be remiss to assume that such a history has no bearing on the socio-political climate that exists here and to overlook the consequences that the past has on our daily experiences. As I knelt at the intersection of such history, there was power in my presence, my body functioning as a totem that serves both as a marker for collective and personal trauma, but also asserting value through resistance towards standards of oppression. It is not lost on me that there is another tension that exists within this work, that I, a Black woman, would preserve through performance such experiences that can be traumatic for the Black community, while at the same time intending to reclaim power through pose and posture as my body falls seemingly to its oppressor, only to perpetually rise and yet fall again. I've come to find that there is no neutral ground in matters of reproducing violence, that we all need to critically assess the realities of the role that we all play. In recent years, our heightened use of social media and cellular recording devices has made acts of consuming those considered the other and viewing grotesque events like the killing of unarmed black people more accessible. Through the play, repeat and share nature of the videos on social channels like Facebook and Instagram, Black death becomes a commodity and is essentially suspended in time, ever reverberating, allowing these moments to remain active. What has continually alarmed me, notably in the deaths of Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Michael Brown Jr., Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, amongst countless others, respectively, is that the images of their bodies being shot, 
suffocated or laid out in the streets was and still can be accessed and viewed on demand. I fear that as we continue to consume these images, we will allow ourselves to be desensitized to such unjustifiable acts, leaving more people susceptible to such violences. However, these circulated images have become necessary in gaining visibility in the pursuit of justice for these murders as well. It is a common idea that history repeats itself. And in the social media centered world, it often feels that the viral nature of such imagery parallels the legacy of affirming white supremacy through the public spectacle of lynchings. Daily, my being, my existence is the American experience and not solely relegated to the black American experience or the other experience. I've always had a hard time understanding how as a country we show more regard for a symbol in the name of patriotism than we often do for many of our citizens, particularly black, indigenous and people of color who are not only undervalued, but often considered expendable. A few weeks ago, in response to the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, On Being reemerged in performance on several sites between the Arch and Old Courthouse. Fist held high, recharged with the boldness fueled by the resurgent global, global cry, with a new declaration to hashtag stand. Through mass making, portraiture, and performance, I want to counter the narrative of the Black body being a perceived threat, vulnerable to the violences enacted against it, but in turn, declare that I am, we are, worthy, and should be revered. I'd like to note that a segment of my presentation was originally published in an article that I wrote for All the Art, St. Louis Quarterly in 2019. If you're interested, it's listed in the shared materials document along with other resources for this talk. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Alexis. That was excellent. Next, we have Kevin McKelvey, pronouns he, him, who will be presenting pro uh, Rural Projects Review. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and thank you all for being here. And thanks to Ellen for organizing this. Um, I grew up on the land of the Miami, Kickapoo, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee. I acknowledge these indigenous communities native to this region and recognize where I grew up was built on indigenous land and resources following the forced removal of these people. I want to recognize them as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Some of their last reserves in Indiana were near where I grew up but I didn't grow up on a farm or in town. A few years ago, I realized where I'm from, the edge of a cornfield. And a majority of rural people like me didn't grow up on a farm. What I want to do here today is talk about the, some of the myths and misconceptions around rural people. We're not all farmers. Many of us are expatriates and outsiders. You city folk have been looking down on us for thousands of years. I'm also speaking from my privilege as a white man, a tall one at that. And I hope using my privilege is an effective way to talk about race, genocide, and white supremacy. To work in rural places, you have to know the land. And that story goes back millions of years. And that's where your place-based research should begin. What was your place like 100 million years ago? 5 million, 20,000. I call this the long history. Where I'm from in Indiana was a beach and an ocean 400 million years ago. That's why limestone is everywhere under the soil. 20,000 years ago, a sheet of ice a mile thick ground its way across this flat expanse. But it was flat before that when this part of the swamps and floodplains, when this was part of the swamps and floodplains of the prehistoric river Taze. The bed, that bedrock and geologic time are why you have oil and gas or mineable ore or good trees for timber or good soil for farming. All that time, water, erosion, upheaval created an amazing expanse of hardwoods and prairie, intermittently swampy with rivers and inland seas that rivaled any ecosystem on the planet. Much of what we had, the hardwood forests, the black swamp of Ohio, the Everglades of the North, along the Kankakee River, the prairie pothole region, the tall grass prairie, has been turned into farm fields and subdivisions 
and cities. It's been gone so long, we're just now remembering we need to remember these places. Native Americans had extensive communities and villages near rivers and streams. They farmed garden crops that we still know, like corn and squash, and they farmed the forest, favoring plants and trees that provided food. The Hopo mound builders left us their monuments from 2,000 years ago, and Cahokia near St. Louis was bigger than most European cities 800 years ago. By the time of European colonization, the Miami inhabited what is now central Indiana. Imperialism and colonization have been a century-long project in North America, and disease was a start before government and military powers came to the fore. North America was never a lightly populated Eden. The French and Spanish were just as complic complicit as the British in the initial destruction of native cultures and enslaving Africans. And the rise of the United States required land stealing, border expansion, slavery, horse removal, and unfettered capitalism. The United States has always favored capitalism over individuals or groups of people. Rural areas have always been treated as resources, commodities, or supplies, suppliers. Extraction economies have always been at the heart of rural economies. Timber, then mining and gas, then farming. Most of the commodities have played out. And now less than 10% of rural work, rural people work in agriculture since government policy has favored corporations over farmers. So, uh, European migration has followed speech patterns. And you can see here the Midland dialect, which runs from Pennsylvania through Indiana into Missouri and Nebraska and Kansas. And the, and all this was supported by transportation, first on our many rivers, then on our railroads, and then on our interstates, which all led to river cities, lake cities, and capital cities, as John C. Tiford defines them in his book, Cities of the Heartland. Here you can see uh, all the rail lines currently in use in the Midwest. These cities and the smaller ones between can also be seen as boom towns, and some have been busting and declining for decades through deindustrialization, globalization, and suburbanization. These metropolitan areas sustain many counties around them and contribute to the whole state, but the smaller micropolitan cities of 10,000 to 50,000 have always sustained rural areas with jobs and goods and services. As those smaller cities grew, the towns around them atrophied, lost their grocery and their school and their hospital. Rural people have always followed a fierce co code of individualism, but there's also a sort of collectivism and collaboration among neighbors and families. Sociologists call this communitarianism. And there are two kinds of rural to consider. There is rural as a place, space, or location, and there is rural as representation or identity. The social system held up from the time of white settlement until the 1970s with small farms, local communities and industries, and other things like schools and healthcare. It had been slowly declining since the 1920s with improvements in farm technology and increasing industrialization in cities. Moving industry, moving industry, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Moving industry to rural areas helped offset population decline, but not much. All of this started to break apart in the 70s, leading to more poverty in the 80s and 90s and to the drug epidemics in the 2000s. Outmigration along these interstates you see here or has always been an issue in rural areas for a century. And the main commodity of rural areas has always been youth. Carr and Kefalos explore brain drain in their book, Hollowing Out the Middle, and divide up young people into achievers, stayers, seekers, and returners. Some may never come back, and they are usually better educated, more well-off, and more progressive. Who remains helps sustain the cycle around conservatism, lack of education and jobs, racism, and poverty. Power structures remain in place for the elite, the landowners and business owners, and social exclusion and othering is still a central part of rural life. Racism is integral to the functioning of the United States, and it, all, and it has always been present in rural areas. We think of the North as benign emancipators, but except for the Quakers and a few other religious groups, that was never the case. Northerners believed in emancipation for slaves until they realized the slaves might move North. Despite this, black populations expanded in the Midwest in the decades after the Civil War, sometimes, sometimes as sizable populations in cities like Keokuk, Iowa, or as farm communities like Nicodemus, Kansas, or Lyle Station, Indiana. All of this changed around 1890 in what James W. Leowen calls the Great Retreat in his book, Sundown Towns. Whites began expelling blacks, and by 1930, sundown towns and sundown counties had driven many rural blacks into metropolitan cities. This coincided with the Great Migration from the rural south to the industrial north. 
Racial violence was also a northern problem with white riots and lynchings in many northern cities and towns. The Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 is finally more widely known and similar white-led massacres happened in northern cities like Omaha, Chicago, Springfield, Illinois, or Bloomington, Illinois. The lost cause of the Civil War was alive and well in the North, and monuments went up all over. The, went up all over. The rise of the Klan as a political party in Indiana co coincided with this in the 1920s. In the counties with the highest percentage of membership, membership sometimes 25 to 40 percent, were from rural counties with lots of farmers near a manufacturing center in a micropolitan city. Racial resentment has continued for decades, of course, and now it's also aimed at Hispanic immigrants. Hispanics have always been present in the Midwest, first in industrial cities and, um, and then in rural areas as migrant farm workers. They have always held service jobs, such as construction, landscaping, and hospitality, and sub subsequent generations move into white collar jobs. Newer immigrants are now the core workforce of meat packing plants. Dominated culture, as Bell Hooks explains it in her book, Belonging, Culture of Place, is still a major component of rural life, as is white supremacy and its masculinity, gender roles, domestic violence, and racism. Cities and towns and rural areas acknowledge their decline, their brain drain. Maybe they've held on to a tourist destination or lucked into one industry staying. They know they need diverse and inclusive jobs, institutions, and schools. For county elders or government officials, they know they need art and cultural opportunities and infrastructure. They can't just be the corn belt and corn farming anymore. They want their youth to stay or to come back. They know they need, they know they need artists, but so much of this is just more art washing and economic development dressed up with an art project. We need to avoid the drop-in art project that the artist calls social practice when it's really just exploitation. Working in rural areas is more about creating culture than art. And to create culture, you need a sustained, lasting connection. Maybe it's someone you know there, maybe it's your hometown, maybe you move there. It's hard to do socially engaged work anywhere as an outsider. Some of our best models come from Europe because European governments have supported rural people, not rural industries. So there has been a focus on cultural heritage, historic preservation, and infrastructure investment. Devron Projects in Huntley, Scotland, has been ta tackling social issues and creating art and culture in rural areas for 25 years. Their town is a venue project is now morphed into town. The town is the garden project. Apple Shop in rural Kentucky recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. And their place-based filmmaking and community engagement is a model doing embedded local work. Coleman Center for the Arts is engaging social practice artists in community engagement in rural Alabama. In the United States, uh, or sorry, in Minnesota, Art of the Rural is using a similar multifaceted approach and facilitating an urban rural exchange as part of their programming. That same kind of exchange is happening with Kyrux in Kentucky, the Kentucky Urban Rural Exchange. Many rural people end up in cities, and many city folk, including me, have a rural identity. In bridging the urban-rural divide is an integral part of saving rural places. M12 Collective is engaging both landscape and local culture through their ongoing work, including racing old beat-up Chevy Corsicas, one of my favorite projects. Uh, I know this talk is veered into placemaking and placekeeping, and those ideas are integral to an, art, an artist's work in, in a rural area. Do rural people need art or music classes? Do they need art they can see anywhere, like on the side of a barn or, in, or inside the barn or in a field? Yes, they do. Do they need to see your work in a white-walled gallery? Probably not. But the ethos of white-walled galleries can extend beyond those walls into public art. Too many times a city or town brings in a high-profile, co-spaced artist to create art. The art doesn't resonate, embodies these myths and misconceptions I've talked about. The art doesn't understand the local place's history, and it fails. And this is what speaks to me about Worm Farm Institute's work with Detour. These ins installations are spot on and community oriented. They embrace driving, roads, and tourism to celebrate local culture. They work from invited, the work from invited artists is in tune with the people who live there. Rural people want arts and culture and addressing some other problems such as food access and food security while creating art and culture requires understanding that that place is geology, ecology, and history. You build community and culture by engaging people by understanding their history, by talking with them, by inviting them to work on your project with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin.
Next and last is Elise Kirk, pronouns she, her, who will be presenting Picturing Place Teaching Project. And thanks for all the great questions. Feel free to keep them coming in the questions box. Great, thank you, Ellen, and to um, everyone at MCAD, MCAD who's helped uh, put this show together. I'm happy to be here. I'm unmuted, right? Everyone can hear me? Yes, yeah, we hear you. You sound great. <laughs> Um, so I'm an assistant professor of photography in the School of Architecture and Design at the University of Kansas. And tonight I'm going to share an example for understanding place through photography in a university first year seminar. Uh, this is a class that attempts to take on the complex notion of picturing a place. And in this case, that place is Lawrence, Kansas. So for background, I'm a place-based photographic artist myself with a filmmaking background that heavily informs my current work. Professionally, I have a history of producing documentary television for networks like National Geographic Channel, Discovery, and have been hyper aware of how one's relationship to a place, or in many cases lack thereof, impacts the work about it. My own work centers on the psychology and mythology of the Midwest, where I was raised and currently live. Much of the work Form that's developed over the course of years. As an assistant professor in the design department at KU, I've twice partnered with the Office of First Year Experience to teach a first year seminar in place. First year seminars, for those of you who don't have these programs at your institutions and aren't familiar, um, are classes that are offered to incoming freshmen to help introduce them to campus resources and develop common academic skills. Seminars are taught by faculty from a range of disciplines throughout the university and provide students with the opportunity to explore issues, gather and evaluate evidence, and develop their ideas through writing. All seminars, regardless of the topic, uh, share these common learning outcomes, critical thinking, information literacy, communication, and experiential learning, all of which I believe are naturally arrived at through a photography seminar on place. So in addition to those uh, outcomes, I also adopt these two course aims specific to the Picturing Place seminar. Given that most of these students are non-art and design majors with no photographic background, the course aims to introduce the sustained photo product as a method of experience, inquiry, communication, and expression. And given that most of the students are new to Lawrence and maybe even to Kansas or the Midwest, the course aims to help the student establish a meaningful connection with their new place, resources, and community. So students at KU come from, from um, a real mix of urban and rural backgrounds. We've got a large draw from Kansas City suburbs and also small town Kansas. And then we also interestingly have a number of students from California and other coastal areas, um, which are called legacy students whose parents had gone to KU, um, moved away and then send their children back to their alma mater for the traditional middle, middle American experience. So for some students, Lawrence is the largest city they've ever lived in and for others, it's the smallest. So we talk early on uh, in, this in this course about our subjective experiences, and then we transition into coming up with a common understanding or definition of what place is. To do that, we turn to humanistic geographer Yi Fu Tuan, uh, among others, but we, we circle back to Tuan quite a bit. Uh, he, he writes, and we adopt for the class this common definition, that place is a center of meaning constructed by experience. Uh, we, dis we discussed how our experiences of a place may be difficult to articulate, but that the most profound sense of place is born of repeated participation and experience in that place. Um, I, like, uh, I like what Kevin just said, that to create culture, you need a sustained and lasting connection. So to the extent possible, um, we, we try to engage in this practice of um, repeated participation and experience of a place. And then ultimately, we use the framework for the class to translate and make visible our experience of place through a photographic body of work. The course revolves around a semester-long place project that employs photographic inquiry as a process of research and discovery, evolving from, from passive experience to deliberate visualization. Each student identifies a place to experience research and photograph repeatedly. The self-directed nature of the project is critical for, de for developing a meaningful relationship with the place and allows for a diverse range of places and perspectives to be expressed across the class. 
Photographing generally takes place on the student's own time, while class time is used for peer critiques, field trips, discussions, and scaffolded assignments. Class and written reflection assignments become a space to receive and share feedback, as well as to consider the complex questions of, of experiential perspective, authority, representation, and expression as each student progresses towards a deliberate sequence of 10 final images. Importantly, the project culminates in public exhibition at the Watkins Museum of History in downtown Lawrence um, and a significant written reflection. This real world experience learning outcome of the exhibition uh, motivates students through the entire project development process. They get really excited about the fact that their work is going to be on view. Um, so they spend the entire semester uh, knowing that it's going to enter a public dialogue and be shared uh, publicly. So I'll share a series of scaffolded assignments designed to fam familiarize students with resources and progress um, and inform their personal projects. Uh, at the Spencer Museum of Art on campus, students select and reflect on a piece of art that communicates a sense of place, considering ideas of subjectivity, perspective, and interpretation relevant to their own work. In the Goddard Study Center, we pull a series of photographic prints to begin the discussion. Because many students in the class are making work at a place, about a place they're not from, we share example works made in the US by photographers born outside of the country. Um, and I've listed a few examples here on the right of artists that we look at. Um, and as we discuss them, we consider how access and perspective inform their images. As a counterpoint, then we also look at prints from regionalist artists, Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, Grant Wood, uh, artists making work about their home places. And we talk about how artists who are making work from the inside, um, in the case of the regionalists, are taking on a more mythical view, um, as opposed to maybe some of the artists who are coming in from the outside and, and are looking at um, the United States with more of a, a critical social justice lens. So students will pick a piece of art, either that we've discussed in class or that they discover on their own in the museum, and write a short uh, reflection of that work, um, considering, their, considering subjectivity, perspective, and interpretation. We visit the Murphy Art and Architecture Library on campus, where students are asked to select for discussion a photo book in which the photographer's subject is a place. Um, so I've listed some examples on the right of books that I pull to get the conversation started, but students are also welcome to pull a book of their own choosing that we didn't discuss in, in um, class. Uh, the students are encouraged to read the images about, as a body of work, considering approach, context, and sequencing. So we talk about how some of these books might be strictly documentary. Um, some might consider might be fiction, some might be nonfiction. Um, so, Susan Lipper's Grapevine um, is a good example of a body of work that was made in um, place uh, in the East Coast, kind of rural New York, but the pictures are actually staged fictionalizations of a real place in which they're photographed. So we discuss um, um, this paradox between the fiction and the nonfiction and that there are multiple ways to approach a uh, photographic project. Um, inviting the students to think about whether they want to make a strict documentary project about the um, place that they're inhabiting or look at it from more of a mythological perspective and again they write a short reflection about the they, they bring the book uh, to class to do show and tell and they write a short reflection on the book uh, we visit uh, campus and local archives and students identify an archival object that's relevant to their chosen place or research interests on place so we have this, this Kenneth, the Kenneth Spencer Research Library on the KU campus that holds um, documents relating to KU, the Watkins Museum of History in downtown Lawrence that uh, holds documents related to Douglas County history, and the Haskell Cultural Center and Museum at the Haskell Indian Nations University that holds documents related um, more specifically to the Native American history of um, Lawrence and, and the greater Kansas area. So again, students are invited, or uh, to choose one item, share it with the class, discuss it, and write a short reflection of that piece. So these are some finds that have um, come up through this exercise. Uh, clockwise in the top top left, we have Looking South on Mass Street, um, which is our main downtown drag uh, 19, from 1908. Um, top right, we have a contract with a Mr. Robert Wilson from the Kansas Board of Regents from December 6, 1866. Um, um, describing the exact processes of planting a, 
up to 2,000 trees on campus in Marvin Grove. Um, bottom right, cheering football fans on the hill in front of the Campanile on campus in 1979. And then bottom left, preliminary design of Sesquicentennial Point uh, in Lawrence, Kansas in 2004, which I'll show you more of here shortly. Uh, students are also required to conduct interviews with either experts or community members of their place um, and document that interview. And then students also write an artist statement that reflects on their own experience and their own relationship to the place um, and their personal photographic process. Um, so for that, we utilize um, um, a book that I would highly recommend and West's Mapping the Intelligence of Your Work. Um, we also work in individual meetings with me and students to kind of hone these statements and um, and then the KU Writing Center as well. <clears throat> so all of these micro assignments and written reflections function to inform and progress the photographic work, um, which is a 10 uh, image final sequence. And then these micro writings and reflections also collectively shape the long project statement, um, which also fulfills the writing requirement for all first year seminars. So the long project statement synthesizes the various scaffold written reflections into a unified uh, personal narrative about the work. And it's, it's a long you know, research document slash personal reflection, basically written in the first person. Um, and then students distill that long project statement into a short project statement, which functions as the gallery text um, that exists with the photographic images in the exhibition at the museum. So I'll show you some examples of the student place projects that come out of this class. Um, they really range from exploring the public to the private um, and the natural and the built environments. Here's an example of a project made about Marvin Grove. So that archival image I showed you earlier of the contract uh, of those thousands of trees to be planted were planted in an area that was originally prairie land in the middle of the KU campus. Um, and now it's been converted to um, a grove. Uh, for many students, it's a shortcut across campus between classes. So this student's research ranged from the history of the plant, ranged from the history of the planting of the trees in Marvin Grove to a contemporary culture of online world, world building. Um, he discusses in depth his own experience of the grove while watching users inhabit the space seemingly without connecting to it. And he distills his longer um, research and reflection essay into this um, short gallery text that uh, accompanies the photographs. He writes that students of the University of Kansas choose to speed walk to their next destination while simultaneously using a cell phone. A prime shortcut is Marvin Grove, a hidden backyard of the Spencer Museum of Art. There I find time to connect with nature and observe the close up the out of view and the small things missed by those who walk quickly and cut their experiences short. I sought to bring attention to the separation of humanity and nature. We have another student who uh, focused on Sesquicentennial Point, um, which is a gathering space in commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the city's founding. Uh, Interestingly, she found in her repeated time at the point that very few people actually gather there. She, she ran into very few people while she was there, but she um, saw plenty of evidence of people having left their trash behind and ended up documenting um, those marks. So in her longer uh, research and reflection, she writes about initially wanting to make work in the style of American landscape documentary photographer, David Plowden, and he's, his work is pictured in the black and white image in the center of the slide. But her work uh, evolved in response to discovering an artist, uh, Greg Segal, who did a project called Seven Days of Garbage, pictured there on the right, um, which is more kind of staged um, um, still life garbage work. Uh, he approaches his work like a sociologist wanting to provoke reflection from the viewers and ultimately the student Sydney decided that's uh, how she wanted her work to function as well. And she writes in her um, distilled uh, gallery text uh, that she photographs at sesquicentennial point, a supposed gathering place for the citizens of Lawrence. While the people who gather at this place are few and far between, garbage is easily found pushed into the ground or in a crack. My work is shining a light on this detritus hiding in plain sight. 
She goes on to say, this body of work is meant to evoke thoughts and questions about how people are leaving their mark on the landscape and how that might change. Um, and lastly, I'll show you a project from a student who, um, who frequented uh, a place called the White Schoolhouse, which is a community and event space just north of Lawrence. This student traced its history from a schoolhouse to a bar, to a party space, um, to a multi-use community center. And writes, the White Schoolhouse is a multi-use event space located in North Lawrence. In a time when many feel unaccepted, ostracized, and uncared for, safe havens like this are an escape into a world full of familiar faces, acceptance, and support. This is the power of community, and this is what the White Schoolhouse stands for. Um, we're lucky to partner then with the Watkins Museum of History in downtown Lawrence for the public exhibition of the work. Each student chooses one indicative photo from their series of 10 to hang on the wall along with their short statement. And then binders hold the full 10 image sequence so that viewers can see what the, the work is meant to um, look like as a full body. But with the individual images collectively exhibited, um, it's an opportunity for all of the individual projects to coexist as one larger picture of place allowing multiple diverse subjective experiences to collectively express the larger view of Lawrence. It celebrates the work of the students and also contributes to the ongoing archive and discussion, discussion of place, um, which is, a, I think, a really um, strong outcome of the course. But um, beyond sort of contributing to the public dialogue, a lot of the feedback I get from the class that I think is equally as, as important as, and positive is that students who are new to Lawrence um, through this experience have created a relationship with a place that then can they can revisit and that sustains them during their time at KU. And so for a lot of for a lot of them, this is their introduction to a new place and this is their way, this is the way that they start to become participants uh, in their new community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elise. This was great. So now is the time where I would invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras and join in for some Q&A. We've got some really great questions that have come in through the questions box. And I'd encourage all of our attendees, if, if you're still processing, there's so much that we just witnessed through these six presentations, <laughs> that if you're still processing that and you think of a question in any of our remaining time, just throw it in the questions box and we'll we'll get going through these. So I'm gonna start at the top. Um, Karen, there was a question here about the Lamoni mural. It says, love the festival atmosphere for community building. How did you integrate the various voices in voices. the beginning? Um, what was your process for listening, choosing, and proceeding in action? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we, you know, I wanted it to be more of a community oriented thing. And so like when we got this advisory council together, it was really like a lot of knocking on a lot of doors, right? To see like, would you participate? Will you participate? Um, and we become part of this community. And so when we met together and there's probably close to a dozen folks from different kind of areas uh, in the town with different kind of experiences. Then we started to like come up with questions and it was great because it's a blank slate. Um, we had the ability to say we could put whatever we wanted onto that building and the building owner and the town was like green light any way we wanted to go. So it was nice for us to come up with what we wanted to put there. So a lot of conversation happened around that. We talked a lot about like how we asked kind of questions, what kind of an investigation we wanted to do, and then went into the community through that. Um, and then from there, we brought those things back, talked about it, what were the things that were kind of rising to the top, what were the things that we felt like really needed to um, exist in that space. That's fantastic. Thank you for elaborating on that. Um, next, I've got a question for Brandon. Um, for, first, it's sort of a comment. It goes, yes, all caps. Brandon, <laughs> such truth about design thinking and criticality. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes on to ask about, there was a link that you posted at the start of your um, presentation. Can you repeat that for folks? 
Oh, sure. It's um, tiny.cc slash brand place. Um, and if for some reason that's it, you can also look me up online and I can email it to you. I'm, I'm happy to share that. It's just a Google Drive folder, so it's nothing magical. Just forwards that's it. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. Um, we've got a question here for Greg. It says, do the, or I think it's, did the institution place any limitations on what kinds of interventions students could make? Um, and, I never asked. Oh, you never asked. You just did it. That's, that's kind of awesome. Did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize later um, if it becomes a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of our philosophy. I mean, I have had students do things that um, we thought would be a good idea to include the uh, facilities and groundskeeping personnel and they always appreciate being involved. Um, in fact, they're often really energetic and enthusiastic about helping us realize a project. But um, yeah, in terms of, you know, kind of the upper administration of the school, we, yeah, I never really asked. Very cool. All right, thank you. Um, now I've got a question for Alexis. You spoke about the apathetic response of the re of the audience to your uh, to one of your live performances. When your performances enter the virtual world, do you find that the audience is still apathetic, or do they engage differently with your work? You know, that's a good question. Um, I typically don't get feedback from how it works in the virtual world unless there are comments and like an Instagram. So typically, um, a lot of this work plays out on Instagram. Um, and if, if no one leaves a comment, then I don't hear anything. And those comments are typically like, I love this, or I don't know about this, right? And so like how they would respond to me in a physical site is not quite the same as them kind of consuming the work through the digital. That makes sense, yeah, thank you. All right, next I have a question for Kevin. Who is the artist making the installation work with combines and tractors. They missed the name. Can you turn on your mic, Kevin? I thought it was on. Um, that's from um, Worm Farm Institute's uh, detour. So I think if you just look up Worm Farm Institute, you'll see the tractor, you'll see the combine work, uh, but then they also have this really fantastic installation. It's like an old Ford tractor um, with like, wood stacked around it i mean it's just it's really great so i think just go to worm farm institute and really and it's something they've been doing for years so there's multiple years of installations not just this one uh combine with stained glass which actually they kind of just put it in temporarily but then the local community liked it so much that they raised money uh to winterize it uh for for wisconsin and so yeah it's just it's just really amazing awesome thanks all right i have a question for everyone um, is there any way to measure the success of the projects that were described um, and in terms of trying to improve society through murals, conceptual art, performances? Um, this person states, I've been doing murals for years and sometimes I wonder if what I do really has an improvement on people's life quality or society's development. So I think the core of that question was on, um, is there any way to measure the success of your projects? If anyone wants to reflect on that. I think one way is if it spawns other work or interactions or writings, right, or engagement at all. Um, typically, I always tell people like, so, you know, in, whether I'm in performance zone and I can maybe see or not see, or I'm in an, in an exhibition space where the work's on the wall, I'm always watching. And so like that moment when someone stops and pauses and really engages is also a measure. Um, you know, they say we have limited attention span. And so if people are just like running through your project, then I'll, often I'm like, hmm, what's happening here? So yeah, I would say, you know, if something's reproducing off of it, then you know that, that it's sparking engagement and it's making change. That's a great uh, observation. Karen, I see you nodding too. Are you thinking of anything there? Yeah, I think along the same lines as Alexis, like for us, it was cool. We I continue to get feedback like on social media, which is like a really easy thing for us to do now. Um, and also like it's spawning like fundraising for other public projects. Awesome. 
Brandon was, did it. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I was just thinking like part of one of the th things like related to that question that's been really important is it, it sounds kind of cliche, but defining what you're after with the project. Like, what's the goal of this thing? What's the what is success in this particular work? Um, just because particularly with the kind of projects I get involved in each project, there's different goals. There's not like a measure for success for each one. Um, like the the small pathway, the path, the art path that I'm working on right now, the actual goal behind that project isn't really about art. Well, it's about art, but in a different way. It's um, it's not really about putting sculptures in public spaces. It's actually about trying to intentionally place sculptures to make our community walk paths that bring them into different neighborhoods. Um, and so that's what, if we start, we actually, our measure of success there, one of our measurements is actually where are people buying houses? What are the neighborhoods looking mm -hmm. like down the line in certain years? Um, which is a weird thing to measure your work on, but it, it would be a sign that it's doing what we want it to do. <laughs> Absolutely, that's great. Elise, were you? I think, yeah, I think for students and even for myself, a lot of the success is evident in how the project evolves. That you know, did it end the way that it started out, or was there this evolution, this process of discovery, this growth of understanding that happens in the process of making the work and having that work critiqued by people who have different perspectives than you and different experiences than you? And then how do you understand your experience more richly because of that? And then how do you respond? So a lot of that is in the process itself and less in the final outcome and how it's received even. Thank you. All right, I'm going to keep moving. We got a whole flurry of questions here at the end. So I'm going to um, go back up. Karen, I've got a question for you. Um, can you explain the logistics of how to create a paint by numbers system for mural painting? <laughs> yeah, um, it was really, um, you know, we I just tried to make we tried to make the design easy enough to where there are big blocks of color or small blocks of color that didn't take any gradation, just so it felt like anybody could step to the plate. We printed off a lot of um, just full colored prints, like 11 by 17 prints, just to have on site that people could pick up and say, all right, you want to work on these things. Got it. That Does makes that sense. That? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, great. OK, next up, Alexis, I have a question for you. I have a question. All right, it is, you spoke about the app, oh, wrong one, I copied the wrong one there. I <laughs> did that one already. Um, this starts out with a comment. Wow, I am so impressed by the use of your body in your work, Alexis. I'm curious about the research, planning, and safety measures it employed in creating these potentially volatile pieces in public, and uh, which also require you to inhabit these projects fully. Do you take care to bring others with you? Do you have a plan for dealing with what might happen um, in the name of art? Um, yes. Oh, I love that you ended that with in the name of art. Um, mm -hmm. When I actually did um, this on being performance the first time, I was at the end of my graduate studies at Wichita State University. And it was, it was interesting because I posted that initial picture I posted on the first slide an announcement on Instagram, I'm doing a thing tomorrow. And it kind of flagged concern, right? Like administration was like, wait, safety. Um, and so that was the first time I really had to think about what happens if I go into a public site, who do I have to take with me? Um, it really did, you know, when you don a mask, people are all of a sudden afraid of their safety. Yeah. They're not sure who you are. They don't necessarily, you know, there's this kind of idea that maybe I shouldn't be as afraid of a woman, so to speak. They don't know that though, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm completely blurred in identity. Um, and so, yes, I typically have to have someone with me, though this year um, I'm not really around my normal team. So I've been figuring out ways, GoPros, et cetera, to try to take the work out with me. Um, and it's dependent on the performance. Some of these masks I can see out of, some of them I can't. Um, and so that changes the nature of how how you enter and exit space, et cetera. Absolutely. I was thinking yeah. that myself with the not being able to see as fully. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you you were able to address no that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, I have a comment for everyone from someone in the audience. It says, rarely, never do I cry during presentations. Tonight, I've felt like crying several times. Beautiful work, beautiful presentation. So I just wanted to share that one general commentary. Um, next up, I'm gonna hop over to the box here. Um, 
were students always safe to explore spaces within the city and when talking to residents? Are they ever made to feel like outsiders or intruders? I think this question might be for Elise. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, students, I think, ended up choosing places that they felt safe in so that, you know, it ended up being that their what got represented was probably those spaces that were more accessible to students. There were cases where students attempted multiple times to make inroads at a place and couldn't, and so kind of reframed their reframed their project. That happened some. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't think that was there was ever a, a time when students felt unsafe. It just m might be that they weren't getting access. You know, they weren't getting, and so that's something that we had to dis just discuss in the class too. Okay, so why aren't you? Why don't you think you're getting access? You know, you know why is why is that an issue here? You know, do you want to um, try to work through it, or do you want to try to work on a on a place that you know is more accessible to you? So those became the conversations in the class. But I don't think there was ever a time that anyone felt unsafe. Again, it was just whether access was granted or not, and how you know they how they had to kind of have some self reflection in terms of why or why not it was, why not that was granted. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Kevin. <laughs> Great review of projects, and I see tie-ins in one of my current projects. Do you have a bibliography put together somewhere that you're willing to share? Uh, sure. Um, I have many, many stacks of books <laughs> that I've that I've put together, um, um, and I'm and I'm lucky to look, work at a small liberal arts college, and so you know, like I met with a history prof friend of mine who basically just rattled off like 200 years of Midwest history. So I think that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, this book on, I mean, there's some books on the Klan, but, you know, sociology, uh, but if you're from kind of Iowa, um, upper Midwest, emancipation diaspora, it's amazing, like, you know, like, I learned today reviewing this book that, you know, slavery existed in Illinois and Iowa, mm -hmm. you know, even though you kind of think, oh, it was only in the South, but, you know, like, before statehood, that was just permeated everywhere, and so I think, yeah, I'll, um, I'll put everything together and, and share that out. That would be great. And Kevin, since we've got that sort of crowdsourced um, book reading list, if you wouldn't mind putting those in there, I think then it'll all be in one place, which will be really convenient. So thank you. Sure. All right, I've got a question for Greg and Elise. I am struck by the depth of the final work of the students. Would you share a bit of process used to help the students arrive at their final work? Maybe, Greg, do you want to go first, or Elise? How Sorry, about Elise? She, okay. I, I can go first, sure. Um, yeah, it, it is definitely a process that I work on the students with, and there's a lot of uh, sharing, peer sharing, that happens, and a lot of discussion before the realization of their final project. So we go through several rounds of um, them presenting their initial idea, they get feedback from the other students, they go back, refine the idea, and we go through that process two or three or sometimes four times before um, before they actually complete the project. They also do um, a written articulation of what they want to do because verbalizing and writing your ideas are often very, very different processes. So yeah, it, it's it's not quite as simple as me just kind of introducing this challenge, this project, and, the, and then turning them loose. We really want it to be something that they, they, you know, because the other students will often bring up points and ideas that should be considered about a place or a landscape that that specific student hasn't thought of. Mm -hmm. So the, the collaborative and interactive nature of the process makes, the, I think, the final projects much better. Yeah, and I would say in, in my case in the class, it's it's really all about process. Students are really kind of surprised at the beginning of the class that they can't just go to their place once and photograph it and be done, like that they have to go weekly, repeatedly. So they, they're they constantly critiquing. Each student has three digital critiques and then a print critique and then um, 
individual meetings with me. So really it's it's a communal effort from everyone in the class that's giving them feedback about what's working and what's not working and why, or reading the pictures and kind of surprising the photographer with views that they didn't see in their own work. Um, and then, the, you know, the photographer goes and reshoots. Um, so it's, it's a constant evolution. And I guess that, yeah, I guess it's, I'd say just equal parts feedback from all of the people in the class that leads to the final body of 10 images. That's great. Thank you. I have a question for Brandon. Um, it says, I appreciate your pointing out how marketing and branding can be destructive. I always tell people that we are in an illusion. And it was interesting how you explained and displayed examples of how real that is and how we take what we see as at face value versus looking deeper. Great job, thank you for that. That was more of a comment, but that's that's great. <laughs> Passing along the positivity. Thank um, you. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Um, and next I've got a question for Alexis. You mentioned one of your concerns is how the black body is perceived as a threat. Could you talk about how you deal with the way that performance art when it is a public intervention and also mask wearing, sorry, mask wearing can be kind of threatening to people who don't understand what's happening? So part of it is gauging, taking the temperature of what's happening around you consistently. Um, obviously, I mentioned I don't always, I'm not always able to see. And so there are, in those instances, there's someone else with me who I trust and who is able to, there have been moments where people will come up and they're like, what's going on? And those people will sometimes say, well, she's art. And when that happens, they kind of like, you know, yeah. they're fine. Um, but the concern in many ways, they are not in danger, right? I'm there to do a gesture and to engage just not touch anyone, but you know, I'm activated once they come into my presence. Um, and so I am the one usually that is at risk. And so it's this weird like tension of like making sure that they're aware that they're not in harm's way. And I typically have to be, if I can see them, I'm doing something to show that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a balance. Absolutely. I was curious about that personally as well as if, um, if somebody's approaching or they start to get close, do you modify the plan accordingly? I can. Um, I don't typically, they don't have voices, so they don't speak. And so typically it's figuring out a way to show that with my body. Mm -hmm. One of my masks went to Target recently. That was interesting because now masks are normalized, right? And so before this was a yeah. conversation of difference. And now it's, oh, well, she's in a mask, but we're all in a mask. And mm -hmm. so people are still kind of doing that tiptoe of figuring out how to negotiate their space around me, but they're a little less guarded because everyone's in a mask these days. So it's I'm still trying to figure out how this has shifted now that we have um, COVID pandemic in the room. That's a fascinating twist. So uh -huh. yeah. totally unpredictable. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, I've got a question for Karen. How are the compositions determined? I'm sorry if I missed that. Do the students brainstorm on the images? Does the public take part in that image determining process? Yeah, it happened two different ways. The one that we did in West Virginia, um, the students uh, really formed. They each had, um, we got together, we kind of made a hierarchy of uh, the images and what should be included after talking with the community. Um, and then we came together and we made different compositions and started to kind of synthesize those together. And it takes some nudging, right? So because there's a lot of different voices um, and then we take that back into the community as well. That's great. That's great. Um, and I've got, Alexis, you got a whole slew of, <laughs> of oh, questions wow. here um, for our attendees. I'm just gonna pick one more because we're coming up on the end of our time here. Um, so this, this one says, thank you for the presentation. I'm particularly moved by your questions regarding symbols and how they are valued or not, also how they change. My question is about how the power inherent in masking yourself in different identities, as you describe them, changes within your performances. Do your performances develop around the masks or do the masks arise from your ideas for the performance? Um, a little of both in the way that there's a lot of living and observing life. There's a lot of writing and documenting what my experience is routinely. And 
pairing that my personal experience with what I'm seeing in the media, right? Because typically it's both this investigation of my experience and how social media and language and image is playing. Those things that other people perceive through the media impacts how they're relating to me. So it's just figuring out how those conversations are playing and that will lead to, oh, well, have this glass, I have this thing, idea, and they kind of marry um, kind of nicely in the right time. So it's a listening to them, you know. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we have one minute left and I don't want to stop this event without first saying thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. They put in such hard work and the, it, these presentations were so strong. So thank you. Um, for everyone else, all of our attendees, we still have one more evening of this of this four day conference left, and I hope you'll join us. Um, it's been such a pleasure. So many great questions asked, so much great content to process. Um, so feel free to spread the word. This is free. Um, anybody can come. Just sign up, and we will be sending out recording links in the coming week or so. It'll just take us a little bit of time to process that video footage and get it posted. So thank you all. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.